If you turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, I'd just like to read a couple of verses from that to start with this morning. Hebrews chapter 11, and I want to read verses 1 and 6. It says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then drop down to verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. As you know, this uh, morning, I'm going to be starting in a new series of messages. I finished up the last a uh, series uh, a couple weeks ago here uh, talking about to, to be spoken well of. And uh, now I want to just introduce you uh, to the new series that I'm going to be starting and uh, will be presenting to you in the, the weeks and months to come as the Lord allows that to happen. And uh, one of the things I have uh, would like to ask you today, how many of you have seen those signs out that say just the word believe? Any of you see them around? You know, the only problem I have with them is what do you believe? <laughs> what are they saying to believe in? And uh, then I see other signs out, we believe, and then they give a number of social justice uh, kind of statements about where they stand on, on some of those issues. And uh, so uh, they kind of tell you what they're believing, uh, whether they're right or wrong, uh, that's another thing. Uh, but one of the things is I'm wondering, why do you believe what you believe? Uh, and uh, how does what you believe affect the way you live? I think most of us would say that the things that we believe is usually the things that we live out in our lives on a daily basis. And so, one of the things is, what do you believe about the Bible? What do you believe about God? What do you be, believe about Jesus Christ? What do you believe about Satan? Is he real? Is he, or just a figurative type of a person? Uh, what do you think about the different religions of the world? Uh, where did everything come from? What do you believe about that? Uh, what is the purpose of life? How do we know what is good and bad? What do you believe about that? Why is there so much evil in the world today? Is there life after death? Is there a heaven and hell? Will the earth destroy itself one day? Is there truth, absolutes that we should live by? What about evolution, abortion, gay movement, critical race and social justice movements? And we could go on and on and talk about different things. What do you believe in those things and about those things? Where did that belief come Come from in your life because I believe that what we believe should affect the way we live and how we live should reflect what we believe so today I would just like to start out by just talking about why do I believe what I believe? And why do I live the way I live? And of course, in order to come to those beliefs, I believe we need to have a solid foundation in the Bible and what we think about the Bible, what we believe about the Bible. Because if we don't have a strong foundation for what we believe and why we believe it, it's not going to be reflected in our lives as we live on a daily basis. Of course, when I talk about the Bible, 
to a lot of people, and especially if they're not influenced by uh, the teachings of the church, they probably would have a number of other questions that would go along with what the Bible, what about it? And I put a few of those in your bulletin uh, for you to uh, just reflect upon. But why believe the Bible? Uh, you know, aren't there a lot of other religious books and literature and stuff that's out there? So why believe the Bible? And just narrowing it down to the Bible, why those 66 books that uh, we have in the Bible that we use? Because there are other Bibles uh, that include something along the line of the 14 apocryphal books. Why don't we have that included in our Bible that we adhere to? Then uh, could go on, uh, how is it different from other religious books? Why do we choose the Bible to follow when these other religious books follow the books that they say their founders have received from God and they have written them down for people to follow? So why do we follow the Bible? Why not the other religious books? And uh, how was the Bible given? A lot of people think that the Bible has just been given by man. Men wrote down these things that we have in the Bible. Well, they did, but how, how and why? Why was it written? Wasn't it just for the Jewish people, the people of Israel? Why should we adhere to that we're, if you're, we're not Jewish in our background? Why should I do what it says? You know, you hear a lot of that. Well, isn't it outdated? Isn't it uh, uh, not relevant for our day and age? Look at the social uh, justice type of uh, attitudes and things and the different social issues that are being promoted in our society today that back years ago were not accepted. Is the social issues evolving as people believe in evolution? Why do we adhere to the social teachings of the Word of God? Another question that is raised, well, aren't some of the stories just make-believe? How can you believe that a serpent spoke to Adam and Eve and got them to eat that fruit off the tree. <laughs> you know, uh, you can't help but think, you know, serpent speaking, you know, all that kind of stuff along that line. Uh, what about a worldwide flood? Oh, an ark where the animals all came into, and, you know, and it flooded the earth. You know, wow, how can you believe in something like that? And then you go on, you can go through the Old Testament, talk about in Numbers 22 where Balaam's donkey talked to him. <laughs> Have you ever had an animal speak to you? I know some people think they do, but, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, of course, you can train birds to talk. And, uh, and uh, I've heard them say words, you know. But a donkey talking and somebody like the prophet of Balaam being willing to listen to the donkey? <laughs> wow, that has to be some make-believe fairy tale type of a thing. Uh, someone who would spend three days and three nights in the belly of a well <laughs> and survive? How can, how can you believe in something like that? It has to be a made-up thing, a made-up story. It couldn't have really happened. What about, hey, go down and cast your net into the lake and pull out a fish, and when you pick up the first fish you do, you open up its mouth and you find a coin in it. You know, as much as I love fishing and all the fish I've caught, you know what? I still haven't found that money. It just doesn't lay there in their mouth for you to 
to happen. But, you know, this got to be a fairy tale. This couldn't really happen. And then, of course, I guess you could go to that fact of what about someone rising from the dead? Could someone really rise from the dead? Were they, were they really dead then? You know, these are kind of the things that, you know, people bring up and raise questions, and I'm sure there's a, a number of others that people have brought and maybe you have heard in relationship to it. But you know what? A lot of them even come down to, isn't the Bible just a bunch of do's and don'ts? You can't have any fun if you believe in what the Bible teaches. If you follow it to what it says to do and not to do, then, you know, how can you have any fun? Well, I've, I'll just give a little commentary on that there. You know, I've been a Christian for a lot of years. <laughs> but, you know, I probably <clears throat> believe I've had more fun in living my life because I've known what it's all about because of what the scriptures have to say and how I should live it. And <clears throat> I always tell, when I went back to my class reunion and they, they said, well, you're looking pretty good for your age. And, and I says, well, it's all because of the Lord. I haven't got up, caught up in the vices of the world to, uh, to diminish my body and things along that line by getting caught up in different things. But I believe I've lived a great life. I believe I've enjoy, uh, lived an enjoyable life. I'm not saying that there haven't been some hurts along the way, and, and along, but, you know, on a whole, I just, I just enjoy life. If you haven't noticed that yet, <laughs> I, I trust that you do. But, uh, and of course, I think I've told you before, you know, I'm just a positive person because my blood type is A positive, you know. So, <laughs> so, so you know, I can't, be, I can't help but be positive about things, you know. I, that's just the way I am. It's, it's my DNA, <laughs> right? Well, anyways. But, you know, these are some of the questions and some of the issues that I trust in these coming messages that I'm going to bring to you will, will answer uh, many of these questions and put aside those skeptical thoughts and ideas that go against the Bible. Why should we believe the Bible? But why do you believe the Bible? Why do you believe the things you believe? Was it passed on because, well, this is what my parents believe, so that's why I believe it. Do you say those kind of things? Or maybe, maybe you're thinking, well, that's what the church believes. And so that's why I believe it. You might not know the reason why they believe it, but you, you just say, well, I can quote the, the different doctrinal statements that the church has, and, and so I believe that because that's what the church believes, and so that's why I follow it. And, you know, I'm sorry, there's some churches I don't want to follow some of the things that they promote in their, their beliefs. And so, so we need to be careful in that. But why? Why do you believe what you believe? Well, I trust that in these coming messages that I'm going to give you that foundation of how the Word of God came together from Genesis through Revelation and how it took... And let me just sum up uh, the idea of the scriptures and where they came from and in the sense of, as we think of it, the 66 books in our Bibles. And all of you know what those 66 books are. If we quoted them, you could say them all together, right? Starting from Genesis to Revelation. Do you think you could do that? Well, I won't make you do it right now. But before I'm done with these messages uh, following up on the scriptures, uh, maybe one day I'll say, hey, let's say the books of the Bible. Let's see if you know them all. And uh, some of you will say, well, let's sing the, the song that goes along with the Old Testament books. You know, let us sing the books of Moses, of Moses, of Moses. Let us sing the books of Moses. He wrote the law, you know. And, uh, you know, I, the way of learning the books of the Bible are so important for us in our lives. But I trust that we... But you know, these 66 books written over a period of 1,600 years. Can you imagine that? And it wasn't just one writer of the scriptures. There were over 40 men that God used 
to compile the words that are written in those 66 books. And then to look at the scripture as a whole and understand that there's a unity within the books of the Bible. Yeah, you know, they are in harmony with one another and they all focus in on a central message and purpose. And so I trust by the time I'm through with the messages that I'm going to bring to you that you will understand that and you will believe that. Not because your parents believed it, not because we believe it here at this church, but because God's word says it. Therefore, I believe it. You've heard that statement before. God said it, I believe it. <laughs> yeah. And so... Let me read to you what our statement of faith says at our church here. It says, we believe the Holy Scripture, the 66 books, both the Old and New Testament, to be the verbally inspired Word of God, the final authority for faith and practice, inerrant, infallible, and God-breathed through Spirit-controlled men, we believe the Bible to be the true center of Christian union and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creed, opinions will be tried. Wow. But why do we believe that? Well, I have trust, and as I mentioned over and over again already through our time together, that by the time we get through those messages, you will see how God brought together those 66 books compiled in one book as we call it the Bible, the scripture, and how it's so meaningful to us in our lives, not only to know it, but to live it in our lives. And not because I as a preacher says it, but that you believe it because the word of God says it. Because if we go by man's word, we're going to be led astray. As many have been down through the years and still are being led astray today by man's word and not God's word. Well, what I'd like to do now in the remainder of this introductory message to you uh, on the scripture is to point out some key verses to you. Now, there's 10 of them that are given in the outline today. I don't know if you've memorized them or not. I trust maybe you have. If you haven't, that's a good scripture memorization uh, thing to go through. And again, by the time I'm done with these messages, I trust that you will have memorized all 10 of these verses, uh, these seven different passages uh, that we're going to look at this morning. But before we do, let's just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you how you've given it and how you've preserved it down through the years. So that even us today have it so readily available. And we're thankful we live in a country that has given us that freedom to own Bibles and to, and to be able to read it and study it. The sad part, Father, where we have to confess that many times we neglect it. Uh, we do not take the time on a daily basis to open it up and read it as we should. And, and then not only to read it and to know what it says, but then to practice it in our lives. And so, Father, I just pray as we again focus in on your word and what it's all about and why we should believe it and why we should follow it, that you will just touch our hearts through it. For we just pray these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first couple verses I'd like us to look at is 2 Timothy chapter 3. And maybe this is one of the more familiar verses uh, that each of you know and I trust have memorized many years ago uh, because you have saw the importance of this verse in relationship to the scriptures. And it says what? All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, for what reason? That the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. 
Isn't that great? You notice it says here, how did the word of God come? It came by the inspiration of God. He, as it says, God breathed. The words came from the very presence of God. So when we think about the source of the Bible, how did the words in Genesis 1-1 all the way through Revelation chapter 22, and I'm not for sure how many, <laughs> but anyways, uh, how did they all come together? Where did they come from? Were they man's word? Well, according to this verse, it says no. They were the very words of God that he wanted to be recorded and to be preserved for us down through the years so that we have it readily available for different things. You notice the different things? Since God gave it, look at what, how it can profit us in our lives. It starts out by saying that it's good for what? Profitable for teaching. Or uh, King James, I think, puts it doctrine. Uh, and the word doctrine, you know, sometimes we get a little, oh, wait a minute, doctrine? You're going to talk about doctrine? Yeah, that's just boring uh, stuff. But, you know, doctrine is just basically the idea for what does the scriptures teach? What does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about that? So when you think about the word teaching here, uh, it's profitable for teaching for the things that we need to know. We'll see another verse that, that just emphasizes that even more. But profitable for teaching those things that we need to know, those things that we need to believe. And that's uh, another thing. Maybe after I've finished up on the scriptures, we're going to go into to, uh, some of the other uh, statements of faith that we have and the different doctrines that we believe in in relationship to that, and seeing how do these doctrines, how do these teachings of the word, how should they be living out in our lives? Because if we just have knowledge of these doctrines, but we don't understand how they are to affect our lives, it's not going to do us any good. We not only to know these teachings of the scriptures, but we need to understand how, does, how should it affect our lives on a daily basis. That's what's so important about the Word of God. And that's why it's so important for us to, to know what it teaches. And then, of course, one of the things that it teaches us is about reproof. None of us like that word, do we? <laughs> None of us like to be reproved. Well, why did you do that? That wasn't the right thing to do. Ah, oh, no. Here comes another, oh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. You know? <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it's kind of interesting when you look at the scriptures. You know, why did God give us the don'ts of the Bible, the do nots? Uh, it wasn't because he wanted to, to be mean to us and tell us we can't have any fun, but what he understood. And if you really study the things that he says don't do, you'll find out because they are detrimental many times to the way you're, you live your life. He wants the best for you. You know, he came to give you life and give you what? It more abundantly. And how does he give you that abundant life? By giving us a layout in the scriptures about, hey, if you do this, guess what will happen? This will happen. If you don't do this, look what will happen. You know, even in the Old Testament, as God gave the people of Israel the Old Testament scriptures, uh, that he pointed out that, you know, if you obey me, and follow what I teach, things will go well for you. But if you don't, guess what? And we're going to see in some of the messages to come how they disobeyed God and, and it didn't come very, out very well for them because they turned away from the Word of God. And so the Bible does reprove us. And uh, we have the Holy Spirit, if we are saved and have Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, that works in our hearts and kind of points that out to us. I don't know about you, but I think I've been had that pointed out many times in my life, right? As a believer. Hey, what are you doing? You know that's not a good thing to do. Oh, yes, Lord, I know. I'm sorry. And, you know, that's one thing. Always keep an up-to-date confession of your sins before the Lord. When some, you get convicted about something you've done that you, you know the Lord wasn't pleased with, tell him you're sorry about it. And I trust you are sorry about it. And, uh, and just ask for his strength to overcome that in your life. But it's reproof for correction. And of course, the, you know, that's the one good thing about it. I don't know about you. Have you ever corrected your children? 
and told them why you corrected them for what they did? Have you, have you given them the, this is what you should have done here. Do you try to give them positive direction in their life as to how do you overcome this sin? How do you overcome this thing that you've done wrong? Well, give them some guidance in that. Just don't, you know, be abusive to them and, and beat them just because they did something they weren't supposed to do. That's a problem that a lot of people give, fall into when they abuse their children because they, they attack them more for just because they disobeyed them or didn't do what they wanted them to do when they wanted them to do it. So, so but the word of God is not that way. God does reprove us. But he gives us how we can correct that. And one of the biggest ways about sin is confessing it before him. Uh, uh, and that's what 1 John 1, 9 says. I always call it the, the Christian bar of soap verse. Uh, how do we cleanse our lives? You know, It says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Uh, when we confess it, he will forgive us and we will be back in fellowship with him. So reprove. And then instruction in righteousness, uh, how we need that. The word of God just lays it out for us. This is what you need to do in obedience to the Lord. We'll see that in another verse as we get to it. And of course, the whole purpose of this is so that we, as a person, a man of God, one who has Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, may be adequate, and equipped for every good work. That's what God saves us for, is not to, to follow the world's standards and ideas and things, but to follow his word and his standards and his way of conduct in our life so that we can be a testimony to the people around us and trust that that will draw them to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, memorize. Second Timothy chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. It's one of the key verses because it gives us the source from how the scripture came together. Well, the source is from God. What about the way? Turn over to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1. And these verses focus in on verses 20 and 21, but I want us to back up to verse 16. Because as Peter was writing to the believers here and talking to them about the, what they had been taught and why they had been taught it, he gives them a little bit of a background before he then states the way by which the scriptures were brought together. It says in verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales, this kind of goes against those that say that, well, isn't the Bible just a bunch of writings of men, made up stories and things along that line? But here it says that these were not cleverly devised tales. They were not made up by man. When we uh, made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were what? Eyewitnesses of his majesty. Peter was saying, you know, he was one of the 12 disciples. He had been with Jesus for three years. He had seen the miracles and the things that, that he had done through all that time. He listened to the teachings that Jesus gave them on a daily basis as they were together. And he says, now these things that we are saying to you are not made up clever tales these are ones that we have heard and seen in Jesus Christ our Lord. And then it goes on, for when we received honor and glory from God, or when he received honor and glory uh, from God, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. What was going on here when Jesus uh, at the end of his life, just before he was going to go to be crucified, it tells them that he took Peter, James, and John, and they went up on the mountain, and it says that Jesus was glorified, the glory of God came down upon him, and 
Elijah and Moses came and talked with Jesus there on the mount, just trying to encourage him because of what was coming up in just the next few days. And it tells us that when he was there, and while Peter, James, and John were there, they heard the voice of God speak out and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The testimony, that's what he's talking about here. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word made more sure. What's the prophetic word? It's words that are given by God to be able to speak forth the message that God wanted the people to hear and to listen to. And it says, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. And now, listen to what verses 20 and 21 say. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a manner of one's own interpretation. In other words, the, the words that were spoken by the prophets of God, the words that were written by the prophets of God and the writers of the books of the Bible were not their own interpretation of what was going on. They gave the words, as we saw in 2 Timothy 3.16, that they were God-breathed. They were given by, as the next verse says, no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by who? The Holy Spirit, as he spoke from God to them. God, through the Holy Spirit, gave them the message and, and also was there when they were writing them down to write down the very word of God so that we have it readily available for us today to know what God wants us to do and how he wants us to live in our lives on a daily basis. So the source from God, the way it was given is through the Holy Spirit as he worked in the lives of the writers of the books of the Bible from Genesis on to the book of Revelation so that we have it readily available for us to live by and to know what God wants us to be doing in our lives on a daily basis. You know, when we think about the Spirit, the Holy Spirit and His working in the lives, that night that Jesus was betrayed and as He was arrested and as He was then taken uh, the next morning and, and uh, crucified, and we know that He were, was giving words of comfort to the disciples and talking to them. And He told them that He was going to go, but as He would go, He said, hey, I will send you another comforter. I will send you the Holy Spirit. And it tells us that he was going to guide them into the things that Jesus had taught them and the other things that they needed to know. Because in Fort, John 14, verse 26, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you, and you move over a couple chapters uh, about the same time that he was talking to them. And then in chapter 16, verse 13, it says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will disclose to you what is to come. So Jesus was telling them, you know, the, the Old Testament scriptures were already written by this time. Now the New Testament scriptures were going to be put into writing and we'll see how that all works out. But here, the Holy Spirit was going to guide them into the truth so that they were to write down for the people. We'll see that in more detail when we get to that. But that's the second passage about the way the scriptures came. Now, what is the purpose of scripture? If you turn to John uh, ch chapter 20, John chapter 20, 
Now we move from the time that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, rose again, showed himself alive uh, uh, to his disciples on that first uh, and second Sunday uh, after his resurrection. It tells us that as John ends with that and then closes out in the next uh, chapter here, it says in those verses that many other signs, therefore Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. So there were many other things that Jesus did that are not recorded in the four Gospels of the New Testament. And uh, so uh, he is saying here that, you know, there's more things that could have been written, but the things that were written were guided by the Holy Spirit to be put into the Scriptures. And the purpose for that is given to us in verse 31. But these have may been written that you may what? Believe what? That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that what? Believing you may have life in his name. What was the purpose of the writing of the scriptures? It was to point people, and we'll see that in more detail as we get into the other messages, of how it was to point to Jesus Christ and his purpose for coming to this earth to die on the cross for our sins, rising again the third day, and we must believe in him. And when we do, he will give us eternal life. John 3.16, we all know that, very familiar verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that what? Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The purpose of the scriptures and their giving is given and summed up in those two verses there in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And I trust that you will memorize those verses as well because they give us uh, the purpose of the writing of that. If you uh, turn to another one of the, the uh, books that John wrote, uh, 1 John uh, chapter 5, as he was coming to the end of writing this letter uh, to the believers, it tells us in verse 13 of chapter 5, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, in order that you may what? Think about, it might be so. You know, you'll find out after you die. But what does it say? That you may know that you have what? Eternal life. When one believes and receives Jesus Christ as their Savior, as I have and I trust everyone here this morning have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, because if you have, then you can know for certain that you have what? Eternal life. You know that you will live forever. You do not have to live in fear of when you die, whether or not you're going to go to heaven. Because our certainty of that is based upon not our thoughts, not our ideas, but upon what? The Word of God. It's God's word, not man's word, not what I say, not what the church believes. It's what God has said. This is the way of salvation. This is the only way by which you or I can get into heaven. It's through Jesus Christ and believing in him. And these things are written that you may know that you have eternal life. That's the reason. Why well, I believe it's so important for us to have a solid understanding of this word that's been given to us in the Bible so that we believe it and we have that certainty within our lives. And then, of course, how does the, the word of God affect our lives? Turn back to John, back to the, where we were in that same closing things that Jesus was telling the disciples to, uh, to comfort them uh, as he was going to, as I said before, to be arrested, be tried, be crucified, be buried, and of course rising again the third day. But in John chapter 17, verse 17, 
How is the Word of God to work in our lives? As Jesus was praying for the disciples and praying also for the disciples who are going to come. If you have Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're one of those disciples, right? Uh, I'm one of those disciples that are to serve the Lord in my life. And he uh, was praying uh, to the Father for you and for me even back then. And he said, sanctify them in the what? Truth. And where do we find the truth? Thy word is truth. The scriptures is the truth. And God says, and Jesus was praying for you and me that we would be set aside, we would be sanctified for serving the Lord through the truth, understanding what the word of God was all about and how it should affect us in our lives so that we can be that testimony, that we can be that instrument that can be used of God to touch the hearts and lives of others that we have contact with here upon this earth. So the working of the scriptures, the purpose of that was so that it would help us to know how to be set apart for God's use, sanctified, not in man's word, but in God's word, which is the truth. And so another verse, if you don't know this word, verse, memorize it. It's a, it's a short verse, so you should be able to memorize this pretty quick, right? All right, sanctify them in the truth. Thy word is truth. And then another verse. Uh, maybe I should make a, one comment while we're right there before we turn to, to another passage. But uh, you notice in verse 6 of chapter 14, it says, Jesus said what? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Everything that Jesus does was to point people to the truth, the truth of who he was, the truth to what the purpose of his coming to this earth was all about, and the truth of how it should affect you in your life for all eternity by putting your faith and trust in him as your Savior. And then if you remember that verse in chapter 16, in verse 13, it says what? When the spirit of what comes? The spirit of truth comes. The Holy Spirit is referred to as revealing the truth because he is the truth. And so we have this verified in the scriptures. And so what we have is the truth. This is why, as it says there, sanctify them in the truth. It can have a way of affecting your entire life. And that's what this next verse says. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 again. 2 Peter chapter 1. And it starts out in verse 1. It says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us. Look what it says next. What has he granted to us? Everything, what? Pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true knowledge of him, who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Wow, the scriptures. The, the, you know, the magnificent promises, the precious promises of God that has been given to us in the scripture. If God said it, I believe it. And that's all I need. Not because man says it, not because the church says it, not because my parents believe it, but because I believe it because God's word says it. And this is what we need to keep in mind in our lives, that it's valuable for every aspect of our, our life, 
in our God, godliness, for living for him. And when we reach out to the true knowledge, the word of God, we are able then to have and or for it to have an effect upon our lives. Look at verses 5. It says, Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and your self-control, per- perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and your godliness, brotherly kindness, and your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see how that's, the, as we know the word of God and have that true knowledge, how it affects our lives in every aspect. And you know how it kind of works down through our lives so that it even ends up, how do we treat one another? Because it, it talks about brotherly kindness and to your brotherly kindness, love, that agape love that God wants us to show to one another in our lives. Read 1 Corinthians 13 again that, we, that I went through for you uh, in the last couple years here. So the word of God has given and granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness, these precious and magnificent promises of the word of God, these provisions that he gives us. So what should be our response to all of this? Well, one more verse in relationship to the scripture is James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And you get down to verse 22. Or maybe I'll read verse 20, 21 to begin with. It says, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive uh, the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves, what? Doers of the word and not what? Merely hearers who delude themselves. The idea of this here is the exhortation that James gives to us is, is not only to know the word of God, but also to put it into practice in our lives. And it gives us a four-letter word of O-B-E-Y, right? And what is that word? Obey. So be ye doers of the word. In other words, be obeying what the word of God. We've seen the why as we've looked through this. Where did the scriptures come from? It came from where? God. How was it given to the men to write it? Who helped them? The Holy Spirit. And, and, uh, and why are these things written to us? So that we may what? Believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior and he offers to us eternal life through accepting him into our lives. And then, of course, we see how, how we are to be sanctified, how we are to set ourselves apart for him. He's given us the truth in his word to do that. And so the bottom line is, if all those things are true, if this is the way the scriptures have come to us, then what are we going to do with it? He says here in James 1, 2, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, doing what? Deluding yourselves. If you don't believe in what the Bible has to say, you don't put it into practice in your life, then you're going to be lost for all eternity. There's no salvation without understanding the teaching of the word of God, which says Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life that can be given to mankind through faith and trust in him. So it starts in believing in Jesus Christ as who he is and what he did for us and accepting him as our savior. I trust that you have Christ as your savior. 
That's what it's all about. Is to know Him and to live for Him. And He's given us the guidance for us in our lives here in the Scriptures to be doing. Because if we don't, we're just deluding ourselves. If we think there is a heaven and a hell and we don't put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we will not get there. Why do I believe that? Because the Scriptures teach it. Not because man says it. Not because uh, you know the church says it. Not because some religion says it. But because the Word of God says it. That He's given to us. So how can we put our confidence and trust in this Word? How do we know that this is the Word of God given to mankind and not all these other religions and things? We're going to... And I'm going to try to focus. Why did God wait 2,500 years to have the first scriptures written for mankind to follow? We're going to see and try to trace how that all came together and how he put those first five books together uh, through Moses. And then we're going to work from there as to how did these other scriptures come into being? What was the purpose of them? Why were they written? Why were they given for us? And, and then how it's all come together, even into the New Testament scriptures. So in these next messages that I'll be bringing to you, we'll be focusing in on some of them. But first of all, we need to understand. This is where we need to start. We have to have a solid belief in the scriptures in order to have all these other things that we believe and practice and why we do it by having that word of God hidden in our hearts so that we might not sin against God but that we might serve him and live our lives for him and do the things that God wants us to do and as we do guess what people are going to take notice that we are a peculiar people it's not because you know, the church says it, but because God's word says it. And uh, so, do you believe the scriptures? Do you have a strong foundation of that faith? Not because the church believes it, not because your parents believed it, not because, you know, I as a pastor says it, but because you know what God's word says and you want to follow that and live it out in your lives because these next messages are going to be in why. And how can I know what I believe? And how can I live it out in my life on a daily basis? Let's pray. Father, again, we want to thank you for your word. We're thankful how you have revealed it down through the years uh, to those that wrote it. And then, Father, how you've sustained it down through these last 2,000 years so that we have it readily available for us to study and to learn from it and to follow it in our lives. And Father, we just pray as we go through today and through this week that we will not only know what your word says, but we also will practice it in our lives, in the things that we do, in the things we say, the attitudes that we have, the way we treat one another, that through it all, honor and glory would be given to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. This has been a free presentation by Hickory Corners Bible Church. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting us through hickorycornersbible.org slash give. Hickory Corners Bible Church reserves all copyright protection under applicable law and in accordance with our Christian Copyright Licensing International streaming license. For more information about us or to connect with us, please reach out through our Hickory Corners Bible Church Sermons YouTube channel, our Hickory Corners Bible Church Facebook page, or our hickorycornersbible.org website. Our pastors are also available to talk weekdays from 9 to 4 Eastern at 269-671-4505. We hope you will join us next time as we continue helping ordinary people passionately follow Christ.